was just awesome. And um, I don't know who's home, who's visiting, who's from another church. But if I lived anywhere near this place and I had kids, this is where I'd come. Seriously, for a lot of reasons. The anointed of, of the praise and worship is so anointed. Uh, and that's rare to find. Either you find talent or anointing. To find talent and anointing is a double victory. And that's what you guys have in this place. <laughs> praise the Lord. Marky, I still call you Marky. I've known him since he was knee high. And I love this dad uh, who's with the Lord now. I love his mom. And I saw his brother and sister today. So proud of the way you've blossomed into this awesome psalmist. And what an anointing in this place. <clears throat> so whatever you guys are doing, practicing, praying, fasting, feasting, I don't know what you're doing. But you're doing something right. So keep drinking the double shots you're drinking and praying the prayers you're praying because it's working and I just I wanted to share that before I get into the word though I was looking and I could see something in the spirit that you can't see in the natural and you know the Bible says don't just focus on the seen but the unseen and uh, I'm so glad Pastor L is starting this uh, series because sometimes churches seem to get away from the book of Acts. It's too hard. Uh, pastors and leaders will say, it's too hard to manage all of that moving and speaking in tongues and people falling and rolling and he getting healed. It's too hard to manage. What they're saying is I can't control it. And, and uh, it's easier just to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, nope, we're not going to go that route. But I commend you for going that route because... Not only are you going to grow numerically, but spiritually too. God is looking for places that he can give an anointing of a visitation on a regular basis. Yes, which means that it takes it from the realm of visitation to a place of habitation. Where people will come and say, the Holy Spirit's in that place. The Holy Spirit's over there. They're not just going to say, oh, that pastor's awesome. And, and you, you've got an awesome pastor. But they're going to say, that church is awesome. It's powerful. So pour yourself out, Pastor. Pour out what God is pouring all over you as you get into that. And learn everything about the book of Acts. Because you are going to be living the book of Acts over the next few months. You're going to be living it. Stuff is going to happen in those small groups at homes. I see it already. See people getting healed and delivered there. I see nights when, when the Holy Spirit takes complete control. <clears throat> and you just let the Holy Spirit do what He's going to do, but surrender to Him completely. Lord, we thank You for what You're doing tonight. <clears throat> when God called Moses, the last few places I've been going before even the message, I, I do this, and I, I, I've done this because I was very young when the Lord called me into the ministry. When I say I've been in ministry over 50 years, that makes about three or four years before I was born. And um, uh, and a lot has happened in the body of Christ. And you know, I love to take this old bottle and give it new shape. You can't fill, put new wine in an old bottle. What you have to do is take that old bottle, which was a wineskin. Once it was emptied out because that, that wine gave it a certain shape it was strong and it pulled and it stretched the skin and it kept that shape throughout its use until it was empty if you put new wine in it'll stretch it and break it and so what you had to do with that old wine skin is once it was empty dip it saturate it in fresh oil and when you put it in the oil it would shrink down to its original non-shape and then You'd let it dry and you could put new wine in it and it would take a new shape. There are denomination, I'm sorry, denominations that have been around for a long time. <clears throat> and they already have a certain shape. And what God is doing today doesn't fit in their old bottle. They have a form already. So here comes a new wine, new revival, a new move of God. And they can't handle it. Because it doesn't fit the shape that they've got. And it breaks it. So, well, that wasn't of God because it destroyed our church. Destroyed your church because you couldn't, God couldn't put new wine in it. But if you let the Holy Spirit, some of us that have been around for a long time, we just 
Say, God, here I am, back to zero. Saturate me in that new anointing and get rid of all of the old shape from before. I want to not say, God, bless what I'm doing, but whatever you're doing, that's what I want. Give me new form, new shape to do what you want me to do. In fact, I'm going to pray right now for people, before I even get into God's word, who feel you have a calling of God on your life. Maybe you're already working or serving in some capacity. But maybe you just feel a tug or a pull. You know something's up. You know God's plan and purpose is some kind of ministry. Either in a foreign field, across the street, working with children, working with grown-ups, working with seniors. I don't know, but God has something for you. And every talent that you have and every ability that God has given you, you know, it's so that you can return it to Him and it can be used for His glory. Um, some of you know I'm a ventriloquist. And I thought when God called me, I got to put away all this crazy puppets because, <clears throat> Lord, nobody will take me seriously. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, Mijo, <laughs> nobody's taking you seriously now. I was already preaching. I thought I have to put it away. And then the Lord said, no, use what you have. Use what you have. And I don't always use puppets. I mean, I'm a pastor and we pioneered several churches. But, I, but it's so exciting to be able to use that too. Now, some of you are cooks. Some of you are artistic. Some are creative. God has something for everything, everybody. And he's given you something. And you know what he does? He reclaims it. He says, that's not you. That's not your talent. It's my investment in you. This is my investment in you. What God gives you is what He gave you. What you do with it is your gift back to Him. Remember when Moses said, I stutter, I can't, I, I don't want to go to Pharaoh, I don't speak well. God said, what do you have in your hand? My, 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 my staff. That's what He leaned on. That's what he defended himself with. That's what he rested one leg and then the other with. That was his staff. Very well known to him. He held on to that baby. And the Lord said, release it. Throw it down. What you have in your hand. Throw it down. Now when he did, we know what happened. Besides being stutterer, weak, bad self-image, and let's not forget a murderer, and a fugitive, which he was. We find out when he throws it down, it turns into a snake. We find out that he has another problem. He's afraid of snakes. And God makes his staff into a snake. So he jumps and he runs. And as he's running from the snake, he's used to running. He ran from Egypt after he committed murder. He's used to running away from his problems and his weaknesses. As he's running, God says, stop. No, there's a snake behind me. And then heaven angels are saying, God, are you sure this is the man you, you chose? God says, pick it up by the tail. God never wants you to run away from your weaknesses, from your fears, from your phobias. He wants you to grab him by the tail. You don't grab a snake by the tail. God was not trying to scare him. He was trying to get him to confront and deal with something that he wanted to run away from. Talk to us, Lord. And if that's you, God's saying, grab it by the tail. I'm going to help you. I'm going to bless you. Don't run away from it. Face it. When he did, it became a staff again. Now, where's the miracle here? Yes, a, a staff to a snake. No, the miracle was a scared man into a brave man that finally answered the call of God in his life. That was the real miracle there. <clears throat> uh, uh, this young man who's uh, on staff, he's the um, station manager of our TV channel. It's online too, VentanaTV.com, but we, uh, and it's on our uh, app, but uh, we're a regular channel, broadcast channel in the whole Fresno area, 20, channel 22.2, 24 hours. I'm not talking about a program, a whole channel. And um, when Carlos came to us seven years ago at 17 years old, doing community service time, um, I asked him after it was over, I <clears throat> signed the letter. I was going to give it to him. He did his time. My secretary had him outside 
in the heat in Fresno in 100, 220 degrees. I don't know what it was outside, cutting grass. And he came in ready for his letter. And I asked, and then the Lord showed me his brain. I saw his brain. And I saw it like light up, fluorescent. And I said, what are you going to do? He was going back to Southern California. I don't know, probably get in trouble again. And I said, do you work at computer? Not really. Do you Word, publisher, Excel? Do you, uh, no. Do you do graphics? No. Do you edit videos? No, I'm going to teach you. And I sat and taught him. And then all of a sudden that gift that he had locked up inside poured out. And now he fixes computers. And let me tell you something. You need this big, amazing server computer to run the new digital channels like we have. And we have one at our big tower up on Auberry Mountain. It's a 200-foot antenna that broadcasts our signal 24 hours throughout the Central Valley. And this machine should cost about ten to $12,000 so that it'll take our digital signal from our studio and broadcast it and send it to the tower up there and broadcast throughout the whole Central Valley. Well, he built it from the bottom up for less than a thousand bucks. Built it. And he just, and, and, and the first one he built is called Thor. The second one is called Son of Thor. He just built one called Wonder Woman. And his newest one, because we're about to expand into other channels too and add them, his new one is called Ant-Man. Wait, do you see a pattern there or something? Or I, anyway. And how much uh, college, university, how much trade school did he take for to be able to do that? None. None. Because God needed someone to do that, and there was somebody available. Your greatest ability is your availability. He also helps drive, so that's why he flew over here to help us drive back. I have a funeral to do tomorrow. Thank you, uh, Brother Carlos, is right here up front. That was seven years ago. Now, that he first came to us. Now, if you need to surrender your staff, what you have in your hand, it may not be a stick like Moses did, but it may be drawing the arts, working with kids, Dancing, acting. Listen, God needs everything. And, 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 and maybe you have a gift for drama. I mean, most teenagers do, but if there's teenagers, <laughs> maybe. I want you this evening, before I even dig into God's word, and Pastor, I may take this extra moment because I'm feeling that God wants you to take what's in your hand and surrender it to him tonight. So I'm going to make this call. If, even if this is your first time here, even if this is you're already involved in some area of service or work, I want you to take what you have in your hand, like Moses did, and just surrender it to God. And by the way, when he picked that snake by the tail, it became a staff again. He never again called it, listen, m -m 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 my staff. You read Exodus 17, you know what he called it? I'm going to the mountain top with the staff of God in my hand. It was no longer his staff. When you give God your talent, it's no longer your talent. It's now his talent in your hand. So today, I want you to stand up. Those who have a calling, even if you're already active in ministry or if you just don't know what it is, but I want to give him my talent. Can God use this? Yes. He needs bloggers. He needs people in, in media. He needs people who are... Now, when I see kids playing around, I remember the old times when pastors would say, put that thing away, that son of God. Now I tell them, keep learning, mijo. Someday you're going to be doing that for Jesus. I know. Somehow. The world is changing. And the Lord doesn't change, but our methods are continually changing. So he needs a wide spectrum of talents. I want people to get up here and give him what you have in your hand. Right now, just stand up here. I'm going to pray this prayer as you surrender to him your time, your talent, and treasure. And from now on, you're going to see it different as his talent in your hand. And now it can be anointed to win souls, to open Red Sea, to set people free. That's what happened with the staff of Moses when he surrendered it to the Lord. Surrendered it to the Lord. Give it to God right now doesn't matter if somebody told you it's not useful in the kingdom of God. doesn't matter if somebody else 
has tried it and failed. You give him what's in your hand. Give him your voice. Give him your mind. Give him your brain. Give him your talents. Give him your charisma. Give him your sense of humor. Give him your drama. Give him your creativity. Give it to him right now. Lord, we surrender what's in our hand this night. We give to you, Lord, what you have freely given to us. This is yours, God. Use it for your glory. I surrender to you, Lord. I surrender it to you. Come on, go ahead and give it to him. Hallelujah. Holy Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. it to you again this is now your talent your ability in my life thank you Lord oh. now I want you to especially if you know the person next to you if they're related or a friend or husband or wife or something if, even if you don't tell two or three people around you I just surrendered all of my talents to the Lord yeah now, you know what that means, right? That includes your Instagram account, right? Yeah. God bless you. You may return to your seat. Give the Lord a clap offering and clap offering for yourself for answering that call. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, well, is that is that all right? We didn't expect a... A first and second message. Is that all right, Pastor? Are we okay? Good. Praise the Lord. Let's dig into God's Word. My message is short, but I guess we have a double header tonight. But open your heart because God's going to spring some things in your life. The gift of faith is about to operate in somebody that really needs a miracle. How many have someone in your life who's not here tonight, but they need a miracle from God wherever they are? Prison, hospital, at home, wherever. God's going to work a miracle through you for them too. Matthew chapter 9, I'm going to read verse 18 through 21. While he spake these things unto them, that means Jesus was teaching. He was preaching. It was a home service. And whenever Jesus spoke in these home services, people would gather. People would get healed. But he had a great focus on, on the word. As he's giving the word, or as these things he spake unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead. 
but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Now I'm going to focus on that verse, even though we're going to continue reading. It says, verse 19, and Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now here's an interesting fact. The service wasn't over yet. And Jesus just got up and followed this man home and his disciples. If I would have been in that service, I would have said, uh, where's Jesus going? And where's his, his disciples going? He was speaking. That means he was interrupted by faith. This man, it says, stood up. He was a ruler. He had authority. And he was, a lot of uh, Bible teachers believe he had religious authority. And so being something of, of a ruler within the synagogue, he's there. And he stands up while Jesus is preaching, comes all the way forward, bows before him. It says he worshipped him. And he said, my daughter is dead. Come lay hands on her and she shall live. Now, there's so many things happening here. I'm going to try to break it down and do it quickly because I have very little time before the gift of faith starts popping up in some of you. And when it does, I just want you to grab a miracle. Because how do you know the gift of faith is working? Because something you thought was impossible is going to begin to look possible to you. Something you thought couldn't change, all of a sudden you're going to say, hey, it can change. That's the gift of faith. So this man is sitting there with everyone else hearing the word and he has an impossible situation at home. Some of the other gospels give more detail about a turmoil that was going on at his house, a scandal, people screaming and wailing and playing instruments. And this man isn't there. He's sitting in the presence of the Lord hearing God's word. This is important because he should be over there. Any one of us would have been over there where his daughter was dead. What are you doing here? The problem's over there. It's at home. Yeah, but he knew the problem was at home. But he wanted to be where the answer was, not where the problem was. The problem may be at home. It may be at work. It may be at the bank. It may be in the neighborhood you live. That may be where the problem is. But the answer is always in the presence of the Lord hearing God's word. Don't let anything rob you of the answer. It's sitting in God's presence, listening to God's word. What, what made him believe that his dead daughter could live? Seriously, what made him believe? That was impossible. It's too late. She's gone. It's not like she's dying. She's dead. What made her believe, what made him believe the impossible? Because he was hearing the word. When you hear the word, it builds your faith. It energizes your faith. It strengthens your faith. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. It doesn't say faith comes by asking for it because people always think faith comes by asking God, give me faith, give me faith. Here's God's answer. I already gave you faith. Well, give me more faith. You don't need more faith. Use what I've already given you. You have faith. Everybody has faith. The Bible says he's dealt to every man the measure of faith. I was listening to the message I preached uh, in my last visit here, and I talked about the measure of faith that God has given everyone. It says clearly he has dealt to every man, almost like a dealer deals a hand to every man the measure of faith. But it doesn't say what measure that is. It can be a measure of 10 gallons. And I know people that have a big measure of faith. They're, they got 10-gallon faith, and they operate their life with that. And these people don't even look for a parking. They pray for a parking spot. <laughs> and a car moves, or a driver dies, or something happens, and it opens up. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. They take no medicine. They never get sick. And then you have people whose measure of faith is like two ounces. They have faith, but it's a small measure. But that's what they operate their life with. They... They take all their medicine, even stuff they don't need. And the person with a small measure of faith should not criticize the one with a big measure of faith. And the one with a big measure of faith should not criticize the one with a small measure of faith. Because it's God who deals to every man the measure of faith. And that's what you operate your life with. But when the gift of faith is in operation, it's not your measure of faith. It doesn't matter if you have great faith or little faith. The gift of faith is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it comes directly from God. It's not your faith at all. It's God's faith that rises up inside of you. 
and you begin to believe the unbelievable, expect the unexpected. And this, that's what happened to this man. He's hearing Jesus preach and he thinks, my situation at home can be resolved. My problem that I'm having at the house, that scandal, that daughter, that problem, it can be resolved. It can, she can rise from the dead. What made him believe that is the gift of faith that rose up inside of him. So what does he do? He comes to Jesus. You know, you got to come to Jesus. People often want a formula. What prayer do I pray? Yeah. What verses do I recite? How many spins do I give? In Spanish, they put on a pulsera balanceada. How many of those do I have to wear? They want a formula. Give me the words to pray. Give me the scriptures to say. Give me the button to push. No, no. Stop looking for healing and do what he did. Draw close to the healer. Stop, stop looking for salvation and draw close to the Savior. Don't look for the miracle, but look for the miracle worker as we sang earlier. Yeah, we used to think that, that one of the names of, the, of God were, I am the Lord that healeth thee or that has your healing. Now we understand that it really means I am the Lord, your healing. Not I am the Lord, your provider. I am the Lord, your provision. We've had it wrong for some time. Well, what's the difference? If the difference is this. He doesn't have what you need. He is what you need. You draw close to him. You draw close to what you need. He's the source. He's not my healing. He's, my, he's not my healer. He's my healing. Yeah, he's, he's not my salvation. He's my savior. So she, he comes to, to Jesus, bows down. He had a lot of reasons to not come. He was already religious, already had authority. Toughest people to reach are the ones who already have their religion figured out. I got my religion. Don't talk to me about yours. Talking to you about Jesus, same thing. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I already prayed. I prayed last week. I prayed a month ago. I was baptized as a baby. Yeah, people like him that are already religious because religion is a good substitute in the world's mind for a true relationship with God. It's too hard for some to do what this man did. Put everything I've learned aside and just come to Jesus. But he did. And that's the first step in any miracle. You've got to see him as the source of your miracle. He's the one. I know that you might be going through something right now that says this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Trust me, if it brings you to God, you're going to say someday that was the best thing that could have happened. It made me come to Jesus, surrender to him. And when he came, he prayed a prayer that made Jesus stop what he was doing and follow him home. I have decided... To follow Jesus, I have decided. Come on, old fogey, sing it with me. To follow Jesus, yes, I have decided. Oh, sounds nice. No turning back. Oh, no, 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 no turning. Oh, sorry, I had to beatbox a little bit there at the end. Well, we had to bring it into this century at least. Now, here's a problem with that. This man was not following Jesus. This man, Jesus followed him home. And 30 years ago, I saw this scripture and it bothered me. And I said, Lord, you actually stopped and you followed somebody home. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I will follow anybody home. I'll follow them to the hospital, to the courtroom, to the bank that says they don't qualify. I'll follow them. If they pray what he prayed. And what did he pray? Simple prayer had two parts. My daughter's dead. Come lay hands on her and she'll live again. That's what I call a whole prayer. Not half a prayer, a whole prayer. Most of us pray half a prayer. My daughter's dead. I lost my job. I'm in awful pain. This disease killed my mother, grandmother. And now it's going to kill me. There's no solution, God. I just thought I'd tell you how bad things are. My daughter's dead. Amen. And they hang up the phone. They, they end their prayer with an amen after they present the problem, 
pray the problem, they, they think it's finished. You know what moved Jesus to follow him home? The same thing that will move him on your behalf. People always say, if your problem is really bad, the Lord will move. No, it's not the size of your problem that moves God. It's the size of your faith that moves him. Yeah. This man said, she's dead. But he didn't say amen until he said, come, lay hands on her, and she'll live. Jesus said, let's go do this right now. See, that's what moves God. The most important part of your prayer, what gets Jesus to follow you home or to wherever the problem is, is when you pray the problem, but pray the answer too. Tell him what you know he can do. That's the prayer of faith. People often pray, oh, it's so bad. Oh, this the mother told me, said to me, pray for my son. What's wrong with him? He's terribly nervous. They actually want to give drugs to him at school to calm him down. He's awful. I said, well, where is he? He's over here. Come over here. Brother Roy Delgado is going to pray for you. And this kid runs <laughs> that way. We were at the front of this church and <laughs> runs that way. And I said, can you just flag him down and bring him so that I can pray for him? He's like that. It's terrible. And so she finally gets him to stand in front of me. And, and, I, and uh, before I pray for him, I said, you pray for him. I want to see how you pray for him. Oh, no. She said, I'm tired of praying for him. I said, what? I, I'm tired of praying for him. There's no change. He's terrible. And I, I'm just, I won't do it. Well, how did you pray for him? What do you mean? I want to hear how you prayed for him. Okay. Pray. Right now? Right now. Okay. She lays her hand on him and says, Lord, my son's no good. He's awful. He doesn't obey. He's disobedient. He's rebellious. He's just like his daddy. <laughs> this is what she's praying. No wonder she's tired of praying for him. I said... You know, uh, let me pray for him. And I laid hands on him. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus <laughs> that you calm this kid down. And the kid wouldn't stop. And then she was too. She had a twitch in her arm like this. I'm sure that's from trying to hold him. And a little while later, her husband comes. Did you tell Brother Roy to pray for our son? He's nervous. We don't know what's wrong with him. The dog must be doing that too. <laughs> it's contagious. She prayed the problem and she was tired of it, of course. That doesn't change anything. God's not going to say, well, you've asked me 30 times, so I guess I better do something to help you. If you prayed the same prayer 20 times, 19 times were in doubt because he heard you the first time. Try praying the whole prayer. Try praying the answer. Lord, my son's a mess, but when you touch him, he's going to be new. This disease is supposed to make me blind, but when you heal me, I'll be able to see again. Lord, the door slammed shut and my, my, my job closed up. But instead of weeping over the door that's closed i'm going to look for the one you're opening you promise the door closes you're opening a new one pray the answer that's what will move jesus into action pray the problem but pray the answer don't hang up on god don't say amen after i give him my list of problems of of of, of the difficulties and complaints the lord never says oh you complain so much i gotta help you Think about it. A boss has never said that to an employee. You're complaining all the time and you've cussed out half of the workforce, so I'm going to give you a promotion. <laughs> that doesn't happen. It's a waste of time and energy. In fact, Jesus did the opposite. When he got to the funeral, and there were, he threw out all of the drama people. They were there crying. Aah! But, you know, it was more of a show. It's not like today. We're really spiritual today. But back then it was a show. Some of those whalers didn't even know the dead person. They were hired to wail at the funeral. 
Yeah, it was part of their culture. You should have seen it. 20 flute players, 30 wailers. Oh, powerful funeral. And many of those that were wailing didn't know the dead person. I don't know if they hired him by the hour, by the tear or what, but they were not real. And Matthew does a great job of explaining it even more than, than Matthew. I'm sorry, John does a, Luke does a better job of explaining it than Matthew. He says they were scandalous. And Jesus said, get out, all of you. Well, one of the waiters said, you would pay me. I was crying real big tears for three hours. I, I was on a roll here. <laughs> Cleared the atmosphere to do the miracle. But it had to happen. He followed him home. Some of you may not have a dead daughter. But you've got somebody at home that needs a miracle. You have an atmosphere problem at your house. Instead of the joy of God, there's gossip and hatred and misunderstanding and fights. You need Jesus to follow you home tonight. There's somebody here tonight that has such a mess in their house. And don't get mad if he starts unplugging people from your life. We love when God brings people to our life. Well, it's just as much a miracle when he disconnects people. Get out, all of you. Get out. Get out. In fact, the biggest miracles will come to you when God disconnects people from your life. He didn't heal her and raise her from the dead until he threw out a bunch of people. Drama people. Drama kings and drama queens. Out. Are you listening to me? You don't need a lot of people in your life. You just need the right people in your life. The ones that are part of God's plan in your life. I'm sorry you were part of my past, but you're obviously not part of my future. So the Lord is sending you out. I'm going to accept that instead of trying to bring you back in because I want you here. Lord, it's what you want. Now, don't anybody go home and say, I got my word of the Lord, honey. Get out of the house. <laughs> Brother Roy said so. No, don't. Don't get me involved in that. <laughs> We're going to pray the whole prayer. We're going to say, this hurts, Lord. But when you lay hands on her, she'll be healed. When you touch me, the pain's going to be gone. When you touch me, this deaf ear is going to be open. My blood will be made new. A new kidney will be in my body. I'll have new strength. My marriage will be restored. Tell him what you believe he can do. That's faith. Faith doesn't just pray things the way they are, but the way they will be when God gets finished with it. You need to start proclaiming and praying that. Stand to your feet. We're going to pray the whole prayer right now. If you have a situation in your home, in your family, in your own physical body. Oh, by the way, who got healed this morning? We had three services. We had some healings. I want to hear a testimony of somebody who already feels a difference that God touched or healed this morning in one of the services. Quick, somebody, come on up here and share it. Testify it. Let people know. Right now, we have people that were healed this morning in one of these services. Do we have somebody? Come on up here, sweetie. Yes, I remember this one. I remember praying for you. You had pain where? Everywhere. You, it was fibromyalgia, you said? And, and, and lupus. And lupus. Yes. And all those pains were everywhere. They were everywhere. Chronic pain every day. What happened after prayer? It's gone. It's gone. No more pain. God healed you. Go thank you, the Lord. Thank you for that testimony. What happened to you? I, I had like excruciating pain in my stomach since Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I called one of the sisters. I go, I need something for it. But I knew if I come, he, God's going to heal me. And that's what he did. It just left. Today. Yes. God bless you. What's your name, sweetie? Shirley. Shirley, thank you so much. Oh, I remember praying for you. What happened to you? Um, I was healed. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, I was healed. Where was it hurting? In my hands. I, I didn't know it was a demonic attack from the devil. Because I've been serving God, and it was a time of a backslidden moment that he came and he attacked me. He attacked you physically. He attacked me physically. You had pain in your hands and your back? hands, my back. And he kept me in a dark place for almost a year. I didn't work. Wow. 
And he kept me there. What's your name? Jeannie. Jeannie, what happened this morning? You, you came in and you, you knew that I needed a healing. It was Jesus. And he reached out and he touched me. And he held my hands and he held my back. No more pain. No more pain. Do something you had trouble doing. Yeah. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you. I, can I say one more thing? Yes. Pastor Anthony said, reach, reach. He said, reach and expect. And I knew you were coming this morning, and I came expecting a miracle. God met you with that. Praise the Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the anointing upon the women's home. There will be more healing. It's going to be known as a place of healing. And Lord, I thank you for the anointing on that men's home. Thank you, God, for an army that you're raising up. Sparks of fire that will be all over the world ministering for you. Now, I'm going to make an invitation tonight. And I want you to do what th that man did that had a great need. He just came to Jesus. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to this altar or to a religion. You are coming to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is what you need. He's going to heal those pains in your body. He's going to remove that anxiety and depression from your life. He's going to break a chain of bondage. He's going to do awesome things. And if you're under attack right now, I want you to come out of your seat. Just stand here and let's believe the gift of faith is in operation right now. Some of you are starting to believe something you had trouble believing. Because the gift of faith is rising up inside of you right now. What was impossible is starting to look possible to you.